Hello. Welcome back to the Space Gulag. Today we're going to be doing What If Sifo Diaz Was Never Killed. Before we begin, special thanks to Cameron Hall for writing this story, and special thanks to all of our patrons. Also, if you want to get some Pride of the Empire merch or the broken one, it is down below on the merch store. And I just opened up the podcast for all those of you that have been asking. If you go to the community page, write some questions down. I'll be doing an interview for myself, and I'll be bringing guests on every other week after that. Otherwise, our story today begins in the year 32 BBY, in the Senate chambers of Coruscant. Jedi Master Sifo-Dyas, who had recently been removed from the High Council due to his radical views, was still in attendance at the special ceremony thrown by Supreme Chancellor Valorum. While this yearly event was regularly attended by Jedi Masters, sifo still stuck out like a sore thumb. Many within the Senate, as well as many higher-up members of corporations, knew of his premonitions, and they all knew that he'd been kicked off the High Council. sifo felt like all eyes were on him as the ceremony started. Soon into the event, a Mun banker by the name of Hego Damask II would approach sifo inquiring on an idea of a massive army, one commissioned from the cloners of Kamino. This Mun had proposed the same idea mere years earlier to sifo and Master Dooku while meeting with the two on Sereno, but they had never given it any thought. This time, though, sifo was more willing to consider the idea. He had just had visions of a coming war, carnage rampaging through the galaxy, and he felt it was his duty to do whatever he could to stop it. sifo was skeptical, but when Damask offered his personal wealth to fund the project, he began making plans to implement the creation of a clone army. Over the coming weeks, sifo made his way across the galaxy, all the way out to the Rishi Maze, eventually finding the ocean world of Kamino. Arriving at Topoka City, sifo was met by the Keminoan chief cloning scientist Nala Se, who told him that they had been expecting him. sifo was taken aback. He hadn't realized that they were informed of his coming. Little to his knowledge, Damask, aka Darth Plagueis, had made several business deals with the Keminoans in the past, and he had given the cloners a notice of sifo arrival rival, and the clone army he wished to create. Following Nalase into the office of the Prime Minister, sifo would inquire with Lama Su and Nalase, explaining his vision of a grand army of the Republic. The three would convene several more times on Kamino over the coming months, eventually finalizing a contracted deal to commission a clone army of around 1,200,000 clone units. During this same period of time, as the Trade Federation's invasion of Naboo came to a peak, Supreme Chancellor Valorum was voted out of power in a vote of no confidence. In his place, Senator Sheev Palpatine of Naboo was elected into the position of Supreme Chancellor. Palpatine, or more so, Darth Sidious, would celebrate his victory on the night of his election, during which he would invite his master, Darth Plagueis, to his residence. After giving Plagueis copious amounts of alcohol, Palpatine offered his bed to his master, allowing him to fall into a deep sleep. Here, Palpatine would kill Plagueis in his sleep, now becoming the sole Dark Lord of the Sith. With the seeming death of Darth Maul at the end of the Trade Federation blockade of Naboo, Palpatine was now also able to promote his most recent apprentice, the former Jedi Master, Dooku, who would become his sole student now. Dooku had fully given himself over to the dark side, not even weeks earlier after killing Yaddle in cold blood, solidifying his place under Sidious. Yet, he expressed loyalty to his new master and drove to bring the Dark Lord's plans to fruition. After the murder of his master, Palpatine also acquired the assets and authority of Damask Holdings, Plagueis' personal store of wealth and business. Going through the records of Plagueis' dealings, Palpatine would come across a large stream of money that was directed towards the planet of Kamino. Digging further, Palpatine was able to learn of the clone army that Plagueis had commissioned. Palpatine knew of a general plan of his late master to conjure up a manufactured, galaxy-wide conflict, and he could only assume that this army was to be an asset for that plan. Within mere days, Palpatine had already begun implementing his own plan, of course based upon that of his own former master, to take full control and power in the galaxy. The first step in this multi-decade scheme would be solidifying his authority over the clone army in the making. To do this, Sidious ordered his apprentice, Count Dooku, now Lord Tyrannus, to do the unthinkable, to kill his former friend, sifo by any means necessary. Dooku would aptly make his way to the Pike homeworld of Obadia. Here, the Pike Syndicate, a spice-based criminal empire, was waiting for him. They had been informed that a favor was needed from them by the Count, one that would pay very handsomely. 
Upon Duker's arrival, the Pikes would learn that Sifo-Dyas had been sent to negotiate a peace deal by the Supreme Chancellor Valorum mere days before the Chancellor was impeached from office. And Duku was ready to hand over a large sum of credits if the Pikes were willing to do one simple thing, kill the Jedi. The Pikes being the Pikes agreed to do these terms enthusiastically. Killing a Jedi sounded like a difficult task, but for a Sith or force-wielding warrior, it wasn't that difficult. Luckily, the Pikes had no issue with this. They would gladly accept the payment, telling Dooku that they would send him the corpse of the Jedi after he was dead. Dooku, though, felt it was necessary to stay for this ordeal. This may have been because he wanted to see his old friend one last time, or maybe it was because he knew that his heart was not fully engulfed in the dark side just yet, and seeing sifo might push him over the edge. Either way, Dooku stayed. Within the coming hours, sifo accompanied by the former Supreme Chancellor Valorum's personal aide, Silman, arrived on Obadiah to meet with the Pikes. While Valorum was no longer in power, this didn't seem to matter to the two, as they wanted to finish the mission, no matter who was in charge. The two were welcomed by the Pikes, who would take them in and offer them food and a place to stay for the night, which sifo graciously accepted. As Dooku watched his former best friend walk into the Pike Palace, a searing pain ripped through his heart. Not a physical pain, but an emotional one. Turning around and walking away, Dooku ignited his blood red lightsaber. This was the first time since completing his new lightsaber that he had ignited it. Bleeding Yaddle's crystal was harsh on the older man, and he found his still red blade surreal and somewhat startling. Part of Dooku wanted to be angry, to use his blade to cut down everything around him, yet he didn't know who to be angry at. At first, he was angry with the Jedi, but he knew that there were good members inside the Order. Qui-Gon was one of those members before his death, sifo was too one of those members, even Quinlan was one of those good members at such a young age. Should he be mad at Palpatine then, for turning him into someone so vile and so full of hatred? He didn't know. All Dooku knew is that he was mad at himself. Sheathing his lightsaber and making his way back into the Pike Palace, where the Syndicate had prepared a room for him, Dooku thought more and more about the approaching of Dias, and at least talking to his old friend before he was killed. Yet, he couldn't find the courage to do so. That was, at least, until the Pikes informed Dooku that sifo made a quick departure mid-meal. Apparently, the Jedi Council ordered sifo to immediately make his way to Felucia to help bring peace to warring tribes. The plan of the Pikes initially was to poison the drink of sifo after his meal, killing the Jedi Master and keeping Silman as insurance. They needed to improvise. They needed to shoot down the vessel before it left the system. Dooku arrived at the landing platform just moments after sifo had taken off. Seeing the Pikes preparing to launch an attack on the ship, Dooku broke. He shouted at them, telling them not to kill the men. Dooku knew deep down that he would have hatred for himself forever if he killed his best friend. While this would motivate him as a Sith, he wasn't sure that he really wanted that anymore. He wasn't really sure of anything anymore. Dooku would tell the Pikes to shoot the ship down, but to do so while it was still at a low altitude, in hopes that sifo and Silman would survive. The Pikes attempted to question the choice, but complied when the Count increased their payment. Almost in a giddy nature at the thought of more credits, the Pikes immediately aimed their deck cannons at sifo ship and fired, grounding it in only a few quick shots. Within an hour, the Pikes were able to make their way to the downed ship and find Silman and sifo present. As they entered the wrecked interior of the ship, Diaz whipped around and ignited his lightsaber, ready to defend Silman and himself at all cost. sifo was relatively unscathed, but Silman was unconscious and covered in blood, still laying in his seat. The three pikes who entered, as Dooku instructed them to do, slowly drew their weapons and laid them on the floor, kicking them over to the Jedi Master. sifo lowered his lightsaber and sheathed it, picking at the weapons in confusion. Looking between the three pikes, Dias asked what was the meaning of all of this. In response, the three parted ways from each other to reveal Dooku behind them. Almost in shock, sifo dropped his lightsaber and ran over to his old friend. While this wasn't typical behavior displayed by a Jedi, Dooku was no longer a member of the Jedi Order, and sifo didn't really care as the two embraced each other. sifo was still embracing Dooku as he asked what he was doing here, and more so, what was happening. Letting go of his friend, Dooku gestured to the Pikes, telling them to take Silman to the Pike Palace and give them emergency treatment. The aliens obliged, one of them leaving the ship only to return moments later with a hover stretcher. Dooku used a force to assist the Pikes in getting Silman onto the hover stretcher, after which he was rushed off the ship 
and onto a speeder. Alone now, the two friends stood alone in the ship's wreckage. Before explaining anything, Dooku would ask Sifo-Dyas to walk with him. Sifo-Dyas retrieved his lightsaber with the Force, and the two exited the ship and began walking towards the Pike Palace in the distance. Dooku apologized immediately as he looked at the ground and said that he was ashamed of who he'd become in only a few short months. sifo was confused, but without saying a word, Dooku stepped in front of sifo igniting his crimson blade. This was met with a shocked, horrified, and most notably hurt look from sifo who just stood in shock for what felt like an eternity, asking why as he unclipped his own lightsaber and igniting it, illuminating his own face. Dooku admitted he made a huge mistake and asked if sifo could forgive him. sifo couldn't wrap his mind around it. Dooku once more looked at the ground, ashamed of himself. Not only had he betrayed his order, he killed Master Yato and joined the Sith, but he also betrayed sifo his best friend. The Jedi weren't supposed to have emotional attachments such as the one that he had with sifo but the two never really gave much care towards this aspect of Jedi life. sifo had saved Dooku's life on many occasions and had been a rock for the Count. How could Dooku have thrown all that away? Dooku came out of this train of thought, realizing he'd been staring at the ground in silence for several minutes, completely zoned out to the world. With a tear in his eye, Dooku sheathed his lightsaber and threw it to the ground. Using the force, he then pulled sifo lightsaber from the Jedi Master and swung it at the ground in one swift movement, cutting his own lightsaber in half, revealing the blood-red crystal inside. Tossing the saber back to sifo Dooku used the force to extract the crystal from the split lightsaber and take it into his grip. Dooku was approached by his old friend, holding out his own hand and with the crystal in it. Dias slowly reached out his hand and grabbed the crystal. Dooku told sifo that he trusted that he would take care of this until he was again worthy. sifo slowly and hesitantly nodded in agreement, grasping the crystal and putting it in a pocket inside of his robes. Dooku, ready to continue, motioned for sifo to follow him as he once again began walking. Over the course of the next several hours, the two would talk as they made their way back to the Pike Palace. Well, mostly, Dooku would talk, and sifo would just listen, intently, barely believing the information his friend was revealing to him. Dooku first revealed that when he left the Order, he was the one who killed Master Yaddle, and that the crystal within his lightsaber had first belonged to her. This troubled sifo a lot. He was close to Master Yaddle, as she had been a mentor and a guide for him, not to mention she was one of the sweetest voices inside of the Jedi Order. The fact that Dooku could so mercilessly kill her stung him into his very core. Yet on telling sifo story, Dooku himself shed a tear and expressed quite emotionally his regret for his actions. This, while not enough to soothe the pain of knowing the truth, did give sifo some hope that his friend could be redeemed. Dooku also revealed during this time that the Sith were on the rise, obviously, and that he, as well as the killer of Qui-Gon Jinn, Darth Maul, were apprentices of the Dark Lord, Darth Sidious. Dooku explained that this Dark Lord was none other than the Senator or now Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, and that Sidious himself was the apprentice to Darth Plagueis, otherwise known as Hego Damas II, the financer and visionary behind the clone army. Upon hearing this information, sifo began to panic, asking if Palpatine knew about the clone army that was going to begin production soon, and begging Dooku to come with him to Coruscant to inform the Jedi Council on this matter. Dooku responded that Palpatine did know about the clone army, and that he was sent by his master to Obadia to kill sifo and Silman in order to take command of the clone army for use against the Jedi in a war that was still at least ten years away. sifo was stunned, hurt, and still panicking. He attempted to convince Dooku that they had to take action immediately, but Dooku knew better than this, and he had no problem telling his friend that. Dooku explained that they could return to Coruscant, or at least attempt to, but Palpatine was smarter than to blindly trust Dooku or anyone for that matter. Sidious had monitoring systems on Dooku's ship, and even if they were able to get around that, Sidious always scanned Dooku's ship for extra life forms as he entered the atmosphere. Either way, Palpatine would know that something was up, and the three would die long before they could even reach the Jedi Council. sifo would suggest that they use a hollow transmission to contact the Council, but once again, Dooku knew that Sidious was too smart to allow that to happen, and would intercept and jam any messages sent from Dooku or the Pikes to Coruscant. They had no choice but to run, at least for now, and Dooku knew exactly where to go. Over the coming days as Silman healed back up, Dooku and sifo would strike a deal with the Pikes. 
the Pikes would contact Palpatine and inform him of the deaths of Dooku, Silman, and Sifo Dyas. The story would be that Silman died on impact of the ship crash, and Dooku and Sifo Dyas met at the site of the wreckage and engaged in a duel, which led to the deaths of Sifo Dyas and Dooku. In exchange for keeping the secret and lying to Palpatine, Dooku would offer the Pikes a large sum of credits from his personal wealth. With this, Dooku would promise that, after the war, and the downfall of Palpatine, he would grant the Pikes an exclusive Spice contract with Sereno, in which they would be the sole distributors of Spice on the Count's homeworld, for medical purposes exclusively. Though the credits did not seem worth the risk of lying to the Supreme Chancellor, even the mere prospect of an exclusive legal Spice contract with such an important system was worth the risk. They would agree. After a few more days, to allow Silman to recover, the three would depart from Obadiah and make their journey to Kamino. Upon arrival to Kamino, word was already out to the public via the holonet that Sifo Dyas, Dooku, and Silman were all dead. This made their arrival in Kamino even more confusing and alarming to the Kaminoans. The story would go that Silman and Sifo Dyas died trying to quell a local tribal conflict on Felucia, and that Dooku had died in an investigated ship on Obadiah. While speculative about the truth within the Pike's story, Palpatine would accept the story that the Pikes gave him for the time being, as he was lost and panicked with the seeming deaths of both of his students in such a short period of time. Dooku and Sifo Dyas initially met with Tan Wei upon landing, which would immediately request the meeting with Prime Minister Lama Su, as well as a safe place for Silman to continue recovery. Tan Wei would oblige leading Silman to a small room within Topoka City before guiding the two now former Jedi into the office of the Prime Minister. Here, Dooku would make an offer to Lamar Su similar to that of which he made with the Pikes, the remainder of his inherited fortune as continued payment on top of the already paid deposit from Damask Holdings for the clone army, as well as a contingency deal to be the exclusive clone supplier post-war to Sereno and its allies for their local militia needs. The Kaminoans, being largely detached from the galaxy at large, would accept this deal, promising to conceal and harbor the Three and the clone army as a whole for the next ten years. The three refugees would find the next few weeks to be charmingly comfortable. Topoka City was quite beautiful and serene despite its blank interior, and the Kaminoans treated their new guests phenomenally. They were each put up in their own penthouse in the upper levels of the city, given full access to sparring rooms and training grounds, and they were even fed like kings. Granted, the Kaminoan food was something they had to get used to, but they got used to it eventually. Dooku and Sifo Dyas would be approached by Nalase, Lama Su, and Tan Wei about the genetic donor for the clone army. Preparations have been finalized, supplies have been delivered and stored, and construction to the house, feeding, and raising the clones had been finished. The only thing that was left before beginning the actual cloning process was to find a suitable donor and extract their DNA. While Dooku had originally had his eyes set on a bounty hunter named Jango Fett for this purpose, back when he was loyal to Sidious, he knew that Fett would take any and all valuable information back to Palpatine for a hefty payment. In order to stay hidden, they needed a donor that could disappear from the galaxy as a whole, without anyone of power noticing or leaking information to those who would want to profit off of it. The realization hit Dooku and Sifo Dyas at the same time, as they realized that they already had their candidate, Silman. While Silman was shorter, skinny, mildly cowardly, and easily frightened, and very extremely unskilled in combat, he was their best option in terms of keeping their existence a secret. After some conversation with both Silman and Nalase, it was finalized that Silman would be a great genetic donor. The chief Kaminoan scientist ensured the three that they would be able to enhance the DNA of Silman, allowing for the clones to be larger, taller, more muscular, and fearless. While this would take some extra time, it wouldn't be an issue for the Kaminoans. Silman would be set up for life by Dooku after the war. Per Dooku's offer, and was only subject to one requirement, to stay on Kamino for the rest of his life. Luckily, this didn't bother Silman, as he was comfortable in his penthouse apartment, and would most certainly still have Dooku and Sifo Dyas to keep him as company. The next few years or so would come and go, with little galactic change. Palpatine would remain in power, and too busy with cleaning up the fallout of his students' supposed deaths and rewriting in the Sith Grand Plan, never acquired with the Kaminoans regarding Dooku, Sifo Dyas, or the clone army. Dooku, Sifo Dyas, and Silman would live these years in luxury and Kamino, even getting chances to explore the world under the waves of this planet. 
The two would have a large part in the development of the clones, overseeing their birth, training, dietary regimens, and more. Alongside the two former Jedi, several Mandalorians and bounty hunters were brought in to help train these clones once they reached their appropriate age. Individuals such as Kaush Katta was brought in on a highly classified need-to-know basis and never had any interactions with Dooku or sifo They were simply here to train the clones in combat and get paid. While these measures seemed rather drastic to the Kaminoans, Dooku wanted to make sure that every precaution to ensure that his former master's grand plan did not succeed was successful. Alongside this, every clone was implemented with an inhibitor chip while in the pre-birth phase at the request of sifo these inhibitor chips had several purposes, the main one being the suppression of fear and adherence to orders. These chips, though, also contained a set of contingency orders for the clones, ones that if activated would force the clone troopers to follow said order without choice. None of these orders were simple dictations dealing with the order of secession and command should a commander or leader die or commit treason. However, four orders, 37, 65, 66, and 68, were extremely intricate and deadly. Order 37 dealt with using the imprisonment and or the threat of execution of an entire planetary population as a means to extract an individual or groups of individuals that the population was harboring. Orders 65 and 66 and 68 were all focused on treason and capturing, trying, and convicting the offending parties. These applied to the Supreme Chancellor, any singular Jedi, and any singular clone trooper, respectfully. These four orders could only be triggered in the case of a joint two-thirds Senate majority vote, minus the Supreme Chancellor in situations of Order 65, as well as a two-third majority vote from the Jedi High Council, minus the Jedi in question if applicable, in situations of Order 66. This, sifo thought, would be a safeguard against treason while also ensuring the rights of the accused party. Dooku, upon hearing this, agreed with his friend, realizing, rather ironically, that importance of loyalty and the consequences of treason. During the same time, Palpatine made a major step in continuing his plan. Without a puppet leader to join the corporate alliances together and bring different star systems into forming the Separatist Alliance, Sidious went back to Naboo to seek out his former apprentice Darth Maul. Palpatine had seen visions of Maul's suffering, and desperate for an apprentice, he went searching. It wasn't long after reaching Naboo that Palpatine was able to begin sensing the whereabouts of his former student. Palpatine would track Maul to Lothal Minor, where he would find a young Zabrak going insane. Maul's upper torso was attached to a mechanical spider-like body, and he was going on and on about Obi-Wan Kenobi. Luckily, upon seeing his master, Maul was able to collect himself enough to bow at Sidious' feet, reaffirming his everlasting loyalty to the Sith Lord. Sidious would take Maul back to Coruscant and begin both mental and physical recovery for his student. Here in the industrial sector of Coruscant, Sidious would employ his personal medical droids to equip Maul with two fully functional, though heavy, metallic robotic legs. At the same time, Sidious would use a force to stabilize the mind of his apprentice. He was not going to make Maul forget everything, only make him docile enough to think through his own actions. Sidious wanted Maul to remember and relive the pain of the last five years, as it would fuel his anger and his growth in the dark side. At the same time, though, Sidious needed Maul to be controlled enough to be calculative and discreetly manipulative. After another year, Sidious finally cleared Maul to begin taking control of the corporate alliances, collecting their loyalties and forming the structure of the Separatist Alliance. While he was behind in his own preferred timeline, when he was finally back on track with the long-term Sith Grand Plan, Sidious was ecstatic. Maul would passionately take up this mission, using any means necessary to convince, or more so, force the corporate leaders into a council with one another and Maul as their new leader. Within only weeks, the Trade Federation, the Techno Union, Banking Clan, Galactic Corporate Alliance, Commerce Guild, and other major corporations, senators, and crime leaders were members of the newly formed Separatist Council. One of these senators was none other than Rush Clovis, one of the representatives of the Banking Clan. While Maul's control over the Separatist Council became somewhat shakily, as many members were threatened and forced to join, this was only the beginning. Soon after the beginning of the inaugural meeting of this council on Genosis, Newt Gunray of the Trade Federation questioned Maul's tactics of using force and violence to recruit members to their cause. The Viceroy, surprisingly, was not one of the victims of Maul's threats, as he had been in on the idea of the Separatist Alliance since the very beginning. 
but he understood that Maul would not get far with these methods and wanted to make sure what was best for the Alliance and its prophets. At the questioning of his authority, Maul in the meeting room of Genosis would ignite his double-bladed crimson lightsaber and strike down Newt Gunray, killing him instantly. This was enough to scare the rest of the council into quiet submission, for now at least. Unfortunately for Maul, news of him slaughtering Gunray quickly made its way back to Palpatine, who was absolutely furious with his student and his lack of composure and control towards the situation. Even more so, Palpatine agreed with Gunray in that they would only find success in the grand plan of the Separatist Alliance was supported by the people. This was the only way to divide the people and finally take full control of the galaxy. Palpatine would take Maul out of power within the Separatist Council, replacing him temporarily with Rush Clovis. Rush was young, naive, and experienced as a senator, and that made him the perfect puppet for Palpatine's plans. However, Palpatine still wanted a stronger set of executive leaders. Luckily for him, an opportunity was about to arise. As 28 BBY rolled around, the planet of Belmark was subjected to severe seismic activity, causing earthquakes and destroying much of the planet's aqueduct system. As the planet immediately suffered heavy agricultural losses and was sent on the verge of famine, Senator Kalor Gans would approach the Republic Senate and the Jedi Order for relief efforts. The Jedi Order, not seeing enough of a critical emergency, denied help. Meanwhile, Senator Padme Amidala of Naboo and Senator Rush Clovis were allowed three days to find solution on these issues. Accompanied by Senator Mina Bontiri, the three would make their way to the ruined world of Bomark. Here, they would find starvation, destruction, and suffering. The people of Bomark were dying, their planet in ruins, and the Jedi and the Republic offered little to no help. This alone caused so much turmoil and conflict within Padme and Mina, and Rush could see this. The three senators would quickly establish a proposed bill to the Republic Senate, one that would lift restrictions and barriers to trade between mid-rim systems. If passed, enough relief supplies would be able to be brought to the people of Bamark, and the crisis would be solved. Clovis, though, saw quickly growing mistrust with the Republic within Padme and Mina, and he knew that he could bring them to join the Confederacy of Independent Systems if the bill did not pass. During the final night on Bamark, Rush would sneak away from Mina and Padme and send a transmission to Palpatine. In it, he would ask the Supreme Chancellor to block the bill in the Republic Senate. He went on to explain the mistrust for the Republic he saw within his two companions, and he knew that they were the perfect duo of leaders to serve alongside of him in the heads of the CIS. Palpatine needed more capable executives inside of the CIS, and so he agreed to this proposal, only on the condition that Padme and Mina would never know of his involvement with the CIS. Several days would pass before the mid-rim cooperation motion was struck down in the Senate. The corporations within the Senate and the senators funded by them supposedly wanted to keep tight control on the galaxy, and so Padme and Mina, this was their tipping point. After letting two senators stew in anger for several days, Rush Clovis finally approached the two of them with a proposition, to join him at the head of the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Rush explained that, in the Separatist group, they had power over all the corporations, and therefore, they'd be able to get aid through to Belmark. With the Republic increasingly giving more and more power to businesses and corporations, both Padme and Menina liked this offer. They would join Rush in secret for the time being at the head of the CIS. Rush, through the power of Palpatine, would force the corporations to lift restrictions and allow deregulation and nine fine trade between the mid-rim systems. Within weeks, Bullmark was able to be given enough aid to get itself back on track, not without casualties though. Seeing the results of their work, and this new CIS, Padme and Mina pledged their loyalty to the Separatist Alliance. They believed that with the right steps, they could finally make change in the galaxy, positive change at least. The next decade and a half would pass with very little ongoing in the foreground of the galaxy. Rush, Padme, and Mina would slowly and discreetly begin recruiting more and more systems to their Separatist cause, while also distancing themselves from the corporations that initially ran the CIS. The Trade Federation, Corporate Alliance, and Commerce Guild were all either forced or voted out of the Separatist Council, eventually being replaced by Senator Farr of Rhodia, Senator Philo of Kinyan, and Senator Sam of Timbrin. The Techno Union would remain part of the Separatist Council due to its importance as a military supplier, and the banking clans would do the same. While the Council was not in favor of a potential war, they knew that they had to be prepared in case the Republic instigated one upon the revelation of the CIS existing. With this, Rush and Padme would end up falling in love. This would lead to them getting married and having a gorgeous wedding in the hills of Naboo. 
On Camino, Dooku and Saifa Dias, as well as other clone trainers, would see the momentous improvement in the skills and abilities of the clone troopers. These five years would prove instrumental in their training, and would see the first batch of near-ready commando clones in their final stages of training. Also, during this time, Dooku would begin to once again meditate in the Force. While his connection to it was rusty and uncertain, he eventually was able to free his chains in his mind, and come to terms with his past grievances. As time passed, he grew stronger and stronger in the Force. Once again, eventually becoming stronger than he even was in the past. One specific day in 23 BBY, Dooku would approach Sifo-Dyas with his hand held out. Confused, Sifo-Dyas would stare at Dooku's hand, then a look of realization would come over him. sifo would run to his penthouse with a smile on his face, moments later returning to his friend, his hand holding Dooku's blood-red kyber crystal. Dooku, taking the crystal into his hands, bowed to his friend. sifo bowed back. Both former Jedi were familiar with some of the more obscure and ancient texts of the Jedi, and both knew the process to purify a bled kyber crystal. While naturally pure and light in the Force, this process was also mentally tasking and extremely draining. Over the following weeks, Dooku would spend every waking hour in meditation, while sifo made him go to sleep most nights that he could. Dooku would often only get a few hours of sleep before returning to his meditation. Throughout this process, Dooku did not eat, did not speak, and did not remove his focus from the Force. In his meditation, Dooku often saw visions of the past. Many of these were of his low points. He would relive the killing of Master Yaddle every single day. While this did faze him and hurt him emotionally, he had to relive the moment in his mind every day for the last nine or so years. He was numb to the pain it brought, and he hoped that his numbness would take the place of self-forgiveness, but it couldn't. Dooku, between visions of Yaddle and visions of following Sidious' orders, was haunted by visions of him bleeding the crystal he was now trying to purify. Dooku would watch himself in a ghost-like state as the memory of his past flooded his vision. Dooku saw himself pouring all of his hate, anger, and pain, trauma into the crystal. He watched the past version of himself writher in pain over the crystal's bleeding. Dooku then was in hit with a wave of pain, both physical and emotional, as he was thrust into a vision alongside of his former self. He knew where he was going, and he didn't like it one bit. Dooku's eyesight went white for several moments before fading to see his former self in a vision, staring at the child version of himself, no more than three years old. Both Dooku's watching his younger self being beaten by their father. He was a wretched man who hated both the Jedi and the Force, and he despised and abused Dooku for being Force-sensitive. Dooku watched his father punish him and knock him out, before loading him onto his speeder. The vision blurred and faded as Dooku watched the younger version of himself now running through the forest of Sereno, scared and alone, covered in bruises and cuts. Dooku knew what happened next. He almost died, but he was miraculously found at the last minute by a duo of Jedi before he froze to death in the cold night. He was saved by the same Jedi Order that he eventually betrayed. Before, when he was bleeding his crystal, he could only focus on the hate and anger for his father and the pain that it was endured because of the sick, inhumane man. Now though, Dooku realized his own shortcomings, and he understood what he had to do. He knew that he had to forgive his father. Even though he didn't want to, he needed to. Dooku understood that he could not hold on to his pain and trauma forever, and if he did, he would never let go of the hate that he allowed his father to cause to him. Awakening from his meditation, Dooku was met by the stare of sifo who was standing in the corner of the room watching his old friend. sifo smiled at Dooku before glancing to the ground in front of Dooku. Here, a pure white crystal stat. It emanated what Dooku could only describe as peace. He felt the balance and purity within it. Dooku slowly stood up, the joints of his back and knees popping and cracking, twisting his head and slowly cracking his neck. Dooku asked sifo how long he had been meditating. sifo responded that he had been meditating for around three days straight, but he didn't want to interrupt the process as he had seen the crystal changing colors and knew that this was the final stretch for Dooku. Dooku grabbed sifo and pulled him in in a hug, thanking his friend for sticking by his side through everything. sifo smiled before letting go of Dooku and leading him to the penthouse suite. He had one last surprise for his friend. sifo had been able to scavenge the entirety of Topoka City, and he had found a decent array of weaponry parts that he could use for his new lightsaber. Dooku smiled and sat on his bed, closing his eyes and feeling the metallic pieces float through the Force. 
Dooku sat here for several hours, despite being drained from his prior meditation, piecing together different parts and pieces of machinery. While this would not end up looking like a typical Jedi lightsaber, Dooku didn't really care for the aesthetics. He only now wanted to be able to bring peace and balance wherever he went. At the end of what was a very long several days for Dooku, he was staring at a completed lightsaber, one that was curved similar to his old one, while also being so simple, sleek, and that of a dark gray metallic color. Igniting it for the first time, pure light light illuminated the Count's face. As 23 BBY ended and 22 BBY began, the clone army was finally functional with nearly 200,000 units already prepared and trained for combat. At the same time, Padme, Mina, and Rush and their allies were preparing to publicly denounce the Republic and announce the fully formed CIS to the galaxy. However, Palpatine knowing of this coming announcement, and planning it to use as a divide for the galaxy, needed to ensure that nobody within the Senate could stand in his way. While he no longer had access to the clone army, or so he thought, Palpatine was hoping that, when wartime came, the Senate could use the Force or force the Jedi to act as soldiers against the Separatists. To do this, though, he had to get rid of one obstacle, Senator Bail Organa. Organa being close friends with Grandmaster Yoda would be a major roadblock in this otherwise success-bound plan. While Maul was no longer Palpatine's puppet leader, he was still training under the Dark Lord as a Sith apprentice and assassin. With the Jedi Order thinking that Maul had died a decade prior, he would be the perfect weapon to do the job. Palpatine would order Maul to assassinate the Alderinian senator upon his arrival back to Coruscant, and to do so discreetly. Maul jumped at this task, having been removed from active missions by Sidious and wanting to once again prove himself to his master. Late one night, as Senator Organa was returning to the Senate building from his trip to his home world, Maul would put a plan into action, attaching a bomb under the senator's speeder. Maul would wait impatiently, watching as Organa and his staff enter the Senate building, only to come out a few minutes later with Bale holding a data card case. Organa would bid his staff and security farewell as they entered their own respective speeders, and Organa entered his own. With barely enough time to say hello to the pilot, a half-second scream would echo from the senator's mouth before being quickly silenced with the booming sounds of explosions. Maul would laugh, his dark, brooding laugh, as he quietly snuck away from the site of the assassination as sirens wailed in the distance. Over the coming weeks, the Republic would attempt and erupt into chaos as speculation circulated about the death of Senator Organa. Many representatives, along with Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, accused the CIS of assassinating the Alderanian Senator. Contrarily, some senators such as Mon Mothma thought this to be an event as simple as a simple assassination and nothing more, as the Separatists had not been threatened or threatening the Republic, and they had not made any violent moves towards the Republic either. Their case, though, was not helped by the controversial move of Bail Organa's successor, Shelta Relak, withdrawing Alderaan from the Republic and joining the CIS a mere days after the death of the Senator. This move, in her words, was due to the lack of protection, security, and justice offered by the Republic. Many of those saw this as a move by the Separatists to take out Bail Organa in order to bring another core world into their alliance. In response to all of this, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine would enlist the Jedi Order and send several ambassadors to the Separatist homeworld of Naboo as ambassadors, investigators, and negotiators. The Jedi High Council would agree to this, suggesting Obi-Wan Kenobi and his apprentice Anakin Skywalker for the mission. Palpatine, though, knew of the past connection between the duo and Padme Amidala, and for that purpose of conflict, he was not keen on sending the two Jedi who Padme still had fondness for. Instead, Palpatine would suggest Quinlan Voss and his apprentice Ayla Sakura, as they had plenty of experiments investigative work together. The Council would agree, and would immediately dispatch the duo to Naboo. Quinlan and Ayla would make their way to the Mid-Rim planet with the sole intention of investigating the death of Bail Organa and seeing the true intentions of the CIS. Little did they know that Sidious had ordered Rush Clovis to refuse landing to the Jedi and prevent them from reaching the surface of Naboo by any means possible. Palpatine knew that Quinlan would not give up easily, and that the attack of the Jedi convoy would inevitably spark the beginning of the war. As the Jedi approached Naboo, Rush would convince Mina and Padme that Palpatine had sent the most unpredictable and unstable Jedi to Naboo, and that with the accusations of the Separatists killing Organa, this Jedi might be seeking to kill one of them. Mina agreed that these Jedi should not be allowed to enter Naboo airspace. 
Padme, on the other hand, was reluctant to agree. However, she would comply under the condition that they requested Obi-Wan Kenobi to be sent instead of Quinlan and Aylo. Upon receiving the transmission to vacate the system of Naboo, or prepare to be shot down, Quinlan would become cocky, responding that he would not be giving up so easily. Continuing down into the atmosphere of Naboo, the Separatist droid army, courtesy of the Techno Union, would begin firing on the Jedi ship. Quinlan, who was a decent pilot, dodged and weaved his way through the blaster bolts, barely making it to the surface. Ayla, in the meantime, would be in contact with the Jedi Council and the Supreme Chancellor to inform them that the Separatists had begun attacking them. The two Jedi, while making it close to the surface, were shot down over Leorm swamps, barely escaping with their lives. Their only hope was that the Jedi would send additional forces to back them up and save them. The Jedi Council would immediately send their entire reserve forces to Naboo, equaling to around 200 Jedi Knights and Masters. They would arrive to similar gunfire as they descended to the surface of Naboo. In the eyes of the Separatists, this was an all-out invasion, and the two galactic powers were now at war. This news did not take long to spread like wildfire on the hollow net, with breaking news feeds circulating before the Jedi reinforcements even departed from Coruscant. Sif of Dias, while on Camino, spent much of his time keeping up with the ongoings of the galaxy, and he saw this breaking news in real time. He knew that this was the moment they would have been preparing for. A decade's worth of training and work would all come to its peak right here. Dooku and Sif of Dias would swiftly organize 200,000 clone units that were battle ready, and then lead them to Naboo, ready to take the droid forces on and hopefully bring a swift and decisive end to this meaningless war. Within only hours of the Battle of Naboo, the Jedi forces were falling in number as thousands upon thousands of battle droids continued their offensive. The Jedi were close to losing hope and retreating, and Palpatine was giddy with the deaths of so many Jedi. This was looking to be an easy victory for the CIS, though this was changed when two former Jedi, Sifo Dyas and Dooku, came out of hyperspace above Naboo, back from the dead. Within minutes, thousands of clone troopers scattered the now fallen swamp forest. They cut down waves of battle droids, pushing the offensive out of the swamp. The Jedi forces were still alive were astonished, most of them still standing both in awe and confusion. They all had thought that Sifo Dyas and Dooku had died, yet here they were, saving their former Jedi brothers and sisters. More so, none of these Jedi had ever seen a white blade like Dooku's in their lives, and many did not even know such a thing was possible. Yoda and Mace, though, they knew what that meant. Both masters would approach the two former Jedi once the battle was at a minor standstill, asking what happened and where they had been over the last decade, and where these soldiers came from most of all. The two of them told them that this was not the time to talk about it and they had to act quickly and decisively. Leading the Republic army, Sifo Dyas and Dooku would make a charge on Theed, ensuring that only casualties were of the droids, not of citizens or leaders. Within hours, the Separatist Council was surrounded and taken as prisoners of war. The Second Battle of Naboo was complete. Finally, with a moment of peace, Sifo Dyas and Dooku would explain everything, from Dooku's momentary fall to the dark side and dealings with the Pikes, to the training of the clones and Kamino, and then the two came clean about everything. Then Dooku revealed finally to the High Council that Palpatine was the Sith Lord and the master of the Sith Apprentice seen a decade prior on Tatooine. The council was in disbelief, but with the purifying of Dooku's blood crystal apparent and the story that was told to them, they had no choice but to take this as fact. The Republic forces would treat the CIS leaders hospitably, ensuring their safety and comfort as the root of the conflict was investigated. Anakin and Obi-Wan, who previously survived the battle, would be stationed to protect Padme, Rush, Mina, and the other members of the CIS Council. The Jedi Council, alongside several dozen clone troopers, would make their way back to Coruscant. Here they would enter the Senate building and make their way to Palpatine's office. Met by Palpatine's guard, they would force their way into the room where a confused and baffled Palpatine would sit. He had no idea that the clone army had been even created, and he was panicking in an effort to save his grand plan. Seeing these Jedi, though, he knew he had no choice. Well, he actually had one. Drawing both of his lightsabers, Palpatine lunged forward in an attempt to take out as many Jedi Council members as he could before his own downfall. Unfortunately for him, he wasn't even able to make it to a single Jedi before the clone troopers present shot him down. He was able to deflect a large portion of the blaster fire, but it was of no use as dozens of clones laid down barrage of shots at the Sith Lord. Palpatine died there and then inside of his office. Over the coming months, the Senate of both the Republic and the CIS would launch a deep investigation into Palpatine and in his hand in the Second Battle of Naboo, as well as all the going-ons within the Senate. 
Dooku and Rush Clovis would both come forward and give their testimonies on the matter in front of the Joint Congress for the CIS and the Republic representatives, as well as the Jedi High Council. Dooku would confess to his murder of Yaddle and his brief fall to the dark side, but followed it up with a plea of repentance and begging for freedom. This would be given to him, though he would be barred from ever rejoining the Jedi Order by the Jedi Council. Rush would then confess his actions and following of Palpatine's corrupt orders. He claimed that he was manipulated at the beginning, but by the time of the battle, Palpatine was threatening his wife, Padme, as blackmail to follow orders. For this, he would serve several years in Republic prison and was barred from ever serving as a seat of power in either government. The Republic and the CIS Senates would pardon the Jedi and the clone troopers of any conceived wrongdoings in the death of Palpatine, and the two governments would make peace. Mina Bontiri and Padme Amidala would take charge as speakers of the House and the CIS representatives, and the Republic Senate would hold a new vote for Supreme Chancellor, which would be won by the peace advocating Mon Mothma. Padme would end up divorcing Rush Clovis, vowing to never fall in love again, and dedicate her life to the CIS and the betterment of the galaxy as a whole. This would be her life's work, although some would say her and Anakin may have had something going on, because he was seen on Naboo multiple times after the second battle. The Jedi Order, seeing the faults and being too close with politics, would remove themselves from any government loyalties, instead serving the people of the galaxy, whether Republic, Separatist, or other. They would allow sifo to return, though he would decline, instead opting to take position as a Senate representative for the clone troopers of Kamino. Dooku, on the other hand, would make a life for himself on Sereno, retaking his position as Count. He would also begin working with the clones and ensuring the well-being of the galaxy. Dooku would also follow through on his promises to the Pikes and the Kaminoans, offering both groups exclusive contracts on Sereno. This positive sentiment spread throughout the galaxy, as more and more systems enlisted clone troopers from Kamino to be a part of their local militias and security forces. The clones that fought in the Second Battle of Naboo were granted their full freedom and allowed to live lives as citizens of whichever government they wanted. The clones that did not fight were given contracts by the Kaminoans to become parts of these previously mentioned militias police forces and security forces. Someone would live the rest of his life in luxury on Kamino, enjoying the life that he made there and bonding with the tall, muscular versions of himself that the Kaminoans produced. As for Maul, he would go on the run for several years, eventually confronting Kenobi in an attempt to have revenge. As expected, this would not go well for him, and he would fall short at the hands of Master Kenobi for a second time, ending the line of Sith. Peace would reign through the galaxy, as Jedi, CIS, and Republic all sought to make amends with their wrongs and bring a new era of healing to the people of the galaxy. The Jedi would fight against slavery and illegal spice and weapon rings. The CIS would help the other people of the Outer Rim and Mid-Rim with poverty, starvation, and more. And the Republic would have a newfound focus on Senate representation for all systems in the Republic. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks Benjamin Wells, Jonathan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Darth Cheesy, Apollo, Mad Minute Studios, Anakin003, Lemon Knight, Flynn Van Seas, Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Hit 2,000 likes on this video. I don't know what's coming next, but it is. And if you want to check... Um, uh, if you want to what if let me know blur over to comments but crossovers check out the twitch community discord and patreon and the podcast if you want to support me in other ways i will be doing a podcast interview um in one of the next two weeks otherwise those of you that have asked for the podcast it has eventually it has it has become real um there's merch there's check out the merch that is available until season one of the earth series is over and let's talk about our story um so uh, i didn't write the story as i said thank you special thanks to cameron for writing this story absolutely killed it great story i think uh, the timing was impeccable considering him and i both talked about similar elements of the cloning process um on camino as the bad batch story in the last episode did and this video did as well um but this was a fun story to read especially um because he really went into characters that you don't focus on a lot i love how it focused on uh saifo dias dooku silman um even focusing on uh who was it again uh, quinlan voss at the end that was so cool like the story was really fun because it didn't really focus on characters that we see a lot. And that's something that I see a lot as uh, people from the comment sections you guys saying that you really like about this channel is that that it's not just Anakin this, Anakin that. It's like we, we go into Star Wars and it's a Star Wars channel. And so I really appreciate Cameron for writing this, but I also really appreciate that aspect of this channel that you guys have helped create because we can tell Star Wars stories without it having to directly involve Anakin.
Anakin or you know the main characters that everyone knows from watching the movies. You know, this is a story for for Star Wars fans, you know, and I think Cameron did a fantastic job at that. So otherwise, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all. Spread the love and always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.